About a week ago, I was sitting with a young lady and she was saying how she was led to the Lord years ago and for the last, I don't know, five or seven years, she hasn't gotten involved in the, with the church very much at all and anything. Then she starts saying, you know how it talks about in the end times, the devil is going to deceive a lot of people in the church, so you think a lot of people are going to be deceived? I said, yeah, and you'll be the first one. You'll be the first one that's deceived. He's going to go right after you first. You think you can sit this thing out for five or seven years and you're not going to be the first to be deceived? You're already being deceived. In the book of Galatians, uh, this, this has to do with the, the northeast province of, of the Mediterranean. So if you think of the Mediterranean Sea and then the no northeast region of the Mediterranean, uh, uh, that's Galatia. And there's, there's several churches that are associated with this. Uh, Antioch, Pisidia, Iconium, Lystra, Derby, and and you may remember many of these names that 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 uh, as you read through the Book of Acts. And this this book was to be an encyclical, meaning that it was not to be to just any one of those churches. It was to be to all of those churches in that region of Galatia. So this is to to all of the different churches in that region. Uh, many of these churches Paul had founded. So, so Paul was the founder of many of these churches, and, um, uh, uh, and so he's right, he's very familiar with these churches. He, we, see, we see him visiting these churches in his first missionary journey, uh, uh, Acts 13 and 14, and then his second missionary journey, Acts 15 through 18, and then his third missionary journey, Acts 18 through 20. He went back to, to right through these regions again and again, so if you were to look at a map of... of uh, uh, the travelings of, of Paul, you would see him repeatedly going back to that region. <clears throat> and uh, Antioch was, was, of course, that, that church from which he was, he was sent out, and uh, uh, very familiar with those churches. Now, what he's dealing with here in this book is he's confronting uh, what are referred to as Judaizers, people who were teaching that in order to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, the Messiah, you had to first come under the Old Testament law. You had to first have uh, obedience to the Old Testament law. So Paul, and, and they, were, they would challenge Paul. They were challenging Paul. They were challenging him in his apostleship, saying that, that the apostles are really uh, uh, the 12 that, were, 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 uh, uh, that, that were, were taught under Jesus, and then uh, uh, Judas had, had, had uh, hung himself, and then, and then uh, uh, after he hung himself, he was thrown over the wall, and that's where his, his body was burst open. <clears throat> but, but they had chosen an, another man to replace him named Matthias, and all of this had to take place from Jerusalem. So Paul wasn't an apostle at all. That's what they were saying. So Paul wrote this book to defend his, apost uh, uh, his apostleship. He also wrote this book to show that salvation was by... Uh, uh, it was by grace alone through faith and nothing else, nothing else. By grace alone <clears throat> through faith and nothing else. That's what he was talking about in this book. And uh, uh, he is going to underscore that again and again, that his apostleship was, was in this manner, coming, coming uh, uh, through, through uh, grace alone. And, um, uh, and so, because they were saying that you had to come under the Old Testament law. And then it was also to strengthen, of course, the believers, sanctification, to set them apart, to serve the Lord. So, so uh, uh, we can begin to, to look, if you look in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, Ephesians chapter 2, this concept of grace is underscored here in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. By grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, it's not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And so, he's, he, he, wherever I go, when I talk to people about the Lord, there's this general feeling, it doesn't matter where you go in the world, there's this general feeling that if my good works somehow outweigh my bad works, I'll be all right. I do more good than bad. There's always people worse, a lot worse than me. And, and uh, uh, 
if there's a God, I'll, I'll kind of be okay because I do more good than bad, and it's, it's just waiting these things out in that manner. But, but uh, uh, here it says there's nothing. It's not a result of works so that no one may boast. It's, and it's a gift of God. It's not of yourself. So in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, he is underscoring the fact that this has nothing to do with you. Salvation is all a gift. It is a gift. It says it right here. It is the gift. It is the gift of God. Salvation is a gift. And it all is, is uh, 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 it, we're saved through faith. It's grace, which means an undeserved gift. It comes to us by an undeserved gift through faith. And that's it. And that's what Paul is going to be underscoring in the book of Galatians. But if you read in Ephesians chapter 2 now, verse 10, the next verse says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Salvation is purely by grace through faith. But then once saved, he has many works for us to be about. So the works are not for our salvation. The works are something we are to walk in once we are already saved. And that's why if you go anywhere in the world, you will see the hand of Christians who have built lots and lots of hospitals, who set up many structures, who did many things for the good of people all over the world and continue to do. Because he has called us, it says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. We have been created to do good works. The good works do not get us saved. Once we are saved, he's caused us now to walk in those works, <clears throat> to be about good works. The good works follow salvation. Salvation is purely a gift. And what you will find is human religions all all human-made religions will be based on works. Now, there may be some faith coupled with it, but it is always, well, and you also have to do this, and you have to do this, and you have to do this, because humans always want some level of control over this thing, some level of control over a person's salvation. But in Jesus, there is nothing to do with works. This is not a human-made religion. This is something that has been ordained and set in place by God. So these Judaizers were pushing uh, perversions in several different areas. There, there were uh, 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 in four particular areas. So they taught that there's perfection in the flesh in Galatians 3.3, 3, that there's perfection in the flesh. So this is one of the things that they were teaching, that your flesh could be made perfect. Uh, the other thing that they were saying was there was obligatory observance of days, months, seasons, and years in Galatians 4.4, 4, that you were obliged to observe several, uh, 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 there was obliged observance on, on certain days, on certain months, on certain seasons, and on certain years, much like under Old Testament law. And you were obliged to do this. Now we are no longer obliged. This has nothing to do with people, people uh, uh, setting aside certain periods of time for, for but this is, this is all by, by uh, personal choice. But when they were pushing it as an obligation, that's where it went wrong. The other thing was justification by the law they were pushing. That's in Galatians 5, 4. Justification by the law, the Old Testament law. That you were justified by obeying the law. And fifthly, the mandatory circumcision, Galatians 5, 2. They were requiring Gentiles to undergo circumcision as a mandatory uh, element of, of uh, salvation that they had, had to come under the Old Testament law. This was something that they were putting upon Gentiles. Now, Jews believing, believing uh, 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 the, the, the believers among the Jews, those who followed Jesus, those who were Messianic, those who were uh, are sometimes referred to as Jewish Christians, uh, they will often observe uh, circumcision to this day. But that's not the circumcision that was dictated under the law. That's the circumcision that came 430 years before the law. That was a covenant with Abraham, that all of his offspring should undergo circumcision. So they're doing it under that, not under the, the Old Testament law, which was the 613 commandments of Moses. We'll get into to more of that. <clears throat> so with that, that's the backdrop behind the book of Galatians. And 
We're going to look now at, at the, the beginning of the, of the book of Galatians. And st- so let's start reading this in, in Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, and we're going to read from verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not sent from men, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever, uh, uh, glory forevermore, amen. Okay, so the first five verses here. Paul writes this, and the introduction is a little bit different than the introduction of his other books. Paul comes out swinging. I mean, he is just, and, and if, if you think Paul is just a pushover, Mr. Nice Guy, you know, and he's just going to, there's no way, not in this book. He is, he is just, you, you can just sense that, that this, this man has is, is, uh, got a lot that's bothering him as he pens this letter. Now, this is a letter. This was not written in the sense to be an epistle of all, for all time. In God's mind, it was, but Paul was writing a letter to churches with whom he was quite familiar. <clears throat> and he's writing, and he says, Paul, an apostle. You see how, again, he is establishing this up front. One of the things that, that these Judaizers had come in, after Paul would leave these churches, the Judaizers would come in and try to disrupt these churches and say, look, in order to really be saved, you've got to come under the Old Testament law. And this guy, Paul, he's not really an apostle. You've got to listen to the people from Jerusalem. Paul, Paul uh, uh, he wasn't among that group. He wasn't among the inner circle. And, and you can understand there may have been some confusion because when, when the apostles were trying to find a new apostle to replace Judas, one of the things that they said, one of the, re- the requirements was that uh, um, they, they said, uh, therefore it is necessary that of the men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. So this is from, from the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, verse, Acts chapter 1, verse 21, I'm reading. Therefore it is necessary that of the men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us, one of these men must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they were trying to find a, a replacement for Judas, who had killed himself, and in doing that, they said, let's choose from one of these men among us, but the requirement is that they have been with us since the baptism of John, since John baptized Jesus, up until Jesus' resurrection. So we see that there were many people beyond the 12 that had been in, in, in this, this circle with Jesus. He said, let's choose a man from among them. And they chose, they put forward two names. They put forward two names. And then, and, and then uh, uh, so they put forward one named Joseph called Barsabbas. And the other was called uh, um, uh, Matthias. And then they, they, they uh, uh, chose lots. And you say, well, why are they choosing lots? Because that was the Old Testament pattern. That's how they were supposed to do it before the Holy Spirit came. And, and, uh, uh, and so this was the pattern. Now, it's not that God told them to do this. This is the methodology. So the Judaizers were saying, <clears throat> Paul is not from that inner circle. He wasn't, he wasn't uh, uh, there from the baptism of John. Now, Paul redefines what it, the requirements for, for an apostle. And he says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. And so so, uh, Paul says that one of the requirements is you have to have seen the risen Savior, and Jesus appeared to Paul on the road to, to Damascus, so he had seen the Lord. So that was one of the requirements. 
If you do not believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, send me an email and give me a chance to tell you by Zoom why I believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. So they were saying Paul's not an apostle at all. That's why Paul says, Paul, an apostle, right from the beginning, he comes out with this. I'm an apostle. And, and remember, they had said, well, he has to have this, this uh, apostleship from the people of Jerusalem there. But he, he, he contends that in this very first opening, he says, not sent from men, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. So he was not sent from men, nor through the agency of men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. He says, it was Jesus who chose me. It wasn't like there were these, these apostles in, in Jerusalem that chose me. <clears throat> Jesus himself chose me, he says. He says, it was through Jesus and God the Father who raised him from the dead. That's where the selection came from. So you see, immediately when Paul starts writing, boom, he just sets his sights on these people and starts firing away and, and substantiating his apostleship, well, he would, which he will do further on in this chapter as well. <clears throat> Remember, this is just the greeting. This is just the, this is just the opening greeting. And he says, and all the brethren who are with me. I'm not alone in this. There's a bunch of brethren with me. I'm not just the, 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 this lone person out here. There's other brethren with me. We are together in writing this letter. There's other brethren, brethren with me here. There's others in agreement with me. To the, uh, uh, um, to the churches of Galatia, again, establishing this is this, this group of churches in this, this north, uh, I'm sorry, the northeast portion. If I said northwest, I should have said northeast portion of, 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 the, of the Mediterranean. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. There's really the greeting. Just that. That's it. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and he's establishing it is Jesus Christ who is Lord. Now he goes in. Who gave himself for our sins. It is Jesus who gave himself for our sins. There is nothing that you are going to do in fulfilling the laws, the Old Testament law, that's going to that's gonna deal with your sins. Nothing. Nothing is going to deal with your sins in this Old Testament law. Nothing. It is all because of Jesus. He is the one who gave himself for our sins. It is done. It is over. Jesus has done it. It is enough. There is nothing you can do to compare to complement, to enhance what Jesus did on the cross. He gave himself for our sins. You, know, you see, he's going right at this thing. He gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age. The only thing that will take you out of the evilness of your heart is Jesus. There is nothing you can do. There is no fulfilling of the law, no circumcision, no thinking that your flesh is perfect in any way. No way. It's all because of Jesus. Jesus is everything. He has done all of it. It is all because of Jesus. All because of Jesus. All because of him. That's why I say we shall forever, forever be giving thanks to Jesus. He did it all. Our salvation is all based in Christ. All based in Jesus. And it is him who rescues us from this present, present evil age. According to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. That's his introduction. There's none of this stuff where he says, uh, you know, I, I give my th thanks to my God concerning you. And all these, the, these, these nice things that he says in many of his other letters to churches. None of that. This guy is hot. He's on fire. He starts out, right, the, only, the only little bit of niceness you can say is, he, he, he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. Often when he's introducing books, you know, I've heard all these wonderful things about you and you, you know, you're always in my prayers, you're always, at... none of that. He's coming out swinging. And, and uh, this is what, what Paul is saying and he established his apostleship right up front. He established it's in Jesus. It's all in Jesus. His giving himself for us. 
Now we look in verse 6, verse 6 of Galatians chapter 1. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. And so, uh, uh, I'm sorry, as we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, he is to be accursed. For am I now seeking favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. So he says in verse 6, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. He says, I'm amazed. I'm amazed at your behavior. I mean, right, right into this, he goes right after them. Paul doesn't pull any punches. He just doesn't pull back. He tells it like it is. He says, I am amazed at you that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. And apparently in the Greek, there is a, a, a different kind of the same and a, di and a totally different, meaning that, that you can have a Kali and you can have a, 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 a Chihuahua. Those are different of the same kind. They're both dogs. Or you can have a dog and a lizard. Those are totally different kinds. This is speaking of a totally different kind. This is not just, you know, a slightly different, you know, permutation of the way the gospel is presented. He says, no, this is totally different. What they are presenting you with is totally different. This is what he says. He says, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. I mean, Paul, could... Couldn't you just lighten up? Don't you think that, that if you came with a little bit more loving attitude, that, that you know, they'd be more ready to accept it? You know, it, it, it doesn't do any good to just come at them like this. You know, you, really what you need to do is, is, is uh, tell the scribe to put down his pen and just, just go for a walk. Just take a few deep breaths before you come back and write anymore. No, I mean, Paul just, just he's given it to them. And, and uh, uh, he had a place for this. You know, it, it was uh, uh, just about a week ago, I was sitting with a young lady and, and uh, she, was, she was saying how, you know, she was led to the Lord years ago and, and you know, for the last, I don't know, five or seven years, she hasn't gotten involved in the, with the church very much at all and anything. Then she starts saying, so you know, you know how it talks about in the end times that the, the devil is going to deceive a lot of people and, and, and uh, evil pe people in the church? You think, so you think a lot of people are going to be deceived? I said, yeah, and you'll be the first one. You'll be the first one that's deceived. He's going to go right after you first. I mean, you, you think you can sit, at, sit this thing out for five or seven years and you're not going to be the first to be deceived? You're already being deceived. You know, and, and, and I just told her right out. And, and uh, you keep yourself aloof from the fellowship of God, you'll be the first to be deceived. Paul told them as it, just right there, he was quite bold with them. He says, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is not really, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and and want to distort the gospel of Christ. This is a twisting, a total twisting of the gospel of Christ. This is another gospel. This is, I mean, he's just so upset about this thing. He says, but even if we, even if I come preaching to you a gospel that's different from what I've already preached to you, I'd be accursed. If an angel, if you see an angel come preach to you a different gospel than what I've, I've shared with you in the past, that angel is to be accursed. Anybody who comes and preaches this, and as I and, and uh, um, as we have said before, 
So I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. All of these teachers who've come to you with this, let them be accursed. That means totally separated. They are accursed. And Paul is going to, to make it clear that these people who are coming in at this point aren't even brethren. These are false teachers coming in. They're not even brethren at this point. And, and uh, uh, that's what he's going to be teaching them. But he says they are to be accursed. These are super strong words. But I'll tell you something about Paul. He knew what he believed and he preached it. He knew what he believed and he spoke it. And this is how you get the gospel to go forth. It's to be sure of what you've got. The word of God that we have is absolutely certain. Every word in this book is true. You can tell me any sort of theology classes that you've gone into where people will question whether the first five books were really written by Moses or was that written by a committee of rabbis a thousand years after Moses. That is a lie. Moses wrote the first five books, and we know that because Jesus told us. Jesus even told us in the Gospel according to John. He says, if you had believed Moses, you would have believed me because Moses wrote of me. Jesus confirmed this. The word that we have, the words that we have are absolutely sure. The word of God is absolutely sure. And you will always be weak, always ineffective at leading people to the Lord unless you take this book as absolutely true. We have a gospel that works. We have a gospel message that works. This is not a sham. I have seen lives over and over again. People go from being not saved to being saved just like that. Talk to them for 30 minutes, for 40 minutes. They go from not believing in the resurrection to believing in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And their lives change that moment. And then you see this progression of lives just changing over time. That their eyes are finally open. I have seen it so many times. You cannot tell me that this gospel doesn't work. I've seen it work over and over again. This word that we have is so true. This word that we have is a sure word. And unless we take hold of it, as Paul is taking hold of it, that this power that we have in the Lord is true and sure. And if you are unsaved, if you have not given your life to Jesus, if you have not come to the point of believing in his resurrection, which Paul made that as a requirement, that we must confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that he has risen from the dead and then you shall be saved. This is the requirement. This is what the scriptures themselves put forth. If you've not come to that point, come and see me. Let me talk to you. We'll get you to that point. If you're here today, if you're listening to this, you are among those who can easily get to that point. If you just open your heart and receive, you can be saved. You can be saved this very day. You contact me and you can be saved this very day. This is what he's talking about. Paul knew the scriptures. He knew this thing works. This was a sure word for him. He says, if anybody comes speaking to you, any contrary word, let him be accursed. If anybody tells you that this word of God is, 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 not, is not true, let him be accursed. Paul said it. If they come to you with a contrary gospel, that person is accursed, accursed of God. Paul said it right here. He says, even if we should come to you with a contrary gospel than what we've said to you before, let that man be accursed. Let us be accursed if we come to you with a different gospel. He says, if an angel, you may say, well, an angel appeared to me and told me. He says, curse that angel. It's not an angel of light. This is the sure gospel that Jesus himself has died for our sins. This substitutionary death, Jesus has given his life for us. It's not by following any of these things. And you watch, humans will always try to add to this. Yeah, it's that plus you got to take hold of this. Plus you got to do this. Plus you got to add this. I mean, people have said to me, I got a list of pluses that people write to me that I really ought to be saying. You know, in order to get saved, you have to be baptized. No, it is, it is through, it is by grace through faith. Baptism then follows as an act of obedience, but that's not what saved you. 
Some people preach you have to do other things. You have to eat certain foods and not eat other foods. They always want to put human things on it. Well, if you didn't say it exactly this way, then it didn't count. You got it. It is by grace. It is by grace that we have saved, are saved through faith and nothing else. And this is what the man is preaching, and this is what he's intent about. And this is what we're going to study in this book. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for this word. It is a sure word. Thank you, Lord, for the, the words of this book, which remind us over and over again that this is a sure word and there is salvation only by the grace of God, only by the grace of God and taking hold of this through faith and that's it. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have provided the way through your death, through your resurrection, through your very own blood. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that it comes through grace, an undeserved gift. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, I pray for these young people that they would take hold of and be sure of that which they have believed, that they would be sure of it, and let the grace of God abound in their lives. Father, have mercy on them, I pray. And if there be any unbelievers, Father, I pray for the salvation of their souls, that they would reach out to me and that I'd get a chance to share with them and that they could be saved. And I commit this to you for the glory of Jesus and in his name. Amen. Amen.